despite the perception that we are more connected than ever, many and a growing number of people live in the world with an increasing sense of isolation. Like we're connected. In a week, I may jump on a video call with someone in another country, someone in another state, or multiple people all over the world. Like that's a normal part of my life now. And when I'm not at work, if I want to find out what people all over the place are up to, all I have to do is pull out a phone. And I can find out as much as my thumb will scroll. Pictures, updates, articles, links, information, connections, right? More and more and more and more. The striking thing is that in this world of over perception of connectedness, studies tell us that people are experiencing increasing isolation. And this isn't since the pandemic, it goes back before that. So you can go back to 2018, 2019, you know, way back, and find studies that show this stunning experience of loneliness, and even more so sometimes among younger generations of people. So even though we're more plugged in, we feel further away. And then when the pandemic shows up and you just have to stay in your house for months, all of that is amplified and accelerated. We live in a world that tells us we're connected, but we feel oftentimes more isolated. The church offers us help doesn't it? I mean, here we are in a room together. <laughs> Some of us were in a Sunday school class. Others of us will be in a Bible study later on this week with other people. But the church is not exempt from this larger cultural movement into increasing isolation, is it? Because after all, if you're going to really get the most out of a, a gathered community of believers, it's going to take something. From, you're going to have to offer something, aren't you? Like it takes energy and time and investment and vulnerability, doesn't it? I mean, if you're really going to plug in, you got to be honest with people. And you got to let them be honest with you. And maybe you don't want them to be honest with you. Maybe you'd rather just not go there. Because it's easier, isn't it? Oftentimes. Like that kind of vulnerability can be pretty messy sometimes. And you never know if you can, or at least initially, you're not sure if you can trust those folks. It takes time to build that kind of confidence that this person isn't going to use my vulnerabilities against me. And so in the church, we have space to work against that pressure to isolate, but we're not free from the temptation, and we're not even always free from the pressure, because it takes a lot to be invested in the community of the church, the ministry of the gospel that's shared. Beyond just those challenges, which the folks who show up deal with, there are other kind of cultural assumptions about following Jesus in North America that kind of push us to think, well, like, I can just do this Christian thing on my own, can't I? I mean, if I've got Jesus and he's my Savior, do I really need anybody else? I mean, if I've got Jesus and I relate to him, I'm good, right? And there's plenty of folks who kind of live in that space. Like, let me define my own spirituality. Let me call the shots on how I relate. And, you know, Jesus is cool, but his people are really kind of a pain sometimes. <laughs> I'd ask you to say amen, but I'm afraid, you, I'm afraid you would. So me and Jesus got our own thing going. 
And that's fine because my truth is my truth and yours is yours. Like we run into that kind of thing sometimes and it's easy to kind of get pulled in. And the result is we wind up rather more isolated, don't we? problem we're kind of circling around here is that this gospel-worthy life, a life that increasingly embodies the character of Jesus, a life that honors Christ, a life that offers itself for the sake of another, is only formed, perhaps we could say is only forged, in the context of this community and others like it. Jesus doesn't just save a bunch of individuals. He saves a bunch of individuals and incorporates them into his body. He takes a bunch of individuals and makes us a community. And that's the place where he does his primary work. And it's his pleasure to do it. It's his desire to do it. And we can begin to get a sense of that in these opening verses of Philippians. As Paul's praying, the importance of Christian community just begins to come out all over the place, doesn't it? You get the sense that for Paul, this is like incredibly critical because he gets that, he, like he's isolated. We haven't gotten into the letter yet where he talks about the fact that he's writing from prison. He's a captive, he's in chains, and he wants to be with the Philippians. I mean, you've heard him talk about this longing, this eagerness to be with them. He's praying for them. He's, 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 he wants to be with them. And as the letter goes on, that's going to come through again and again and again and again. I want to be there. I want to, I want to show up for you. I want, to, I want to cultivate the things that Jesus wants to do in your life. I long for you. I'm so grateful that you've sent messengers to me. All that kind of stuff is going to come up. And he celebrates the, the, the ways they can connect, even though there's this stunning distance before them. This guy's isolated from Christian community. And as you read through the letter, you feel like that's a weighty, hard thing for him. Doesn't mean Jesus isn't at work. The Lord is using the church to encourage Paul in all sorts of ways. But the striking thing is how Paul emphasizes that Jesus uses the church to encourage the apostle, even though there's distance. So it begins to emerge this, this crucial reality of Christian community and how formative it is. And how essential it is begins to emerge in this place. And it's helpful for me to know that Paul dealt with those kinds of things. Like Paul knew that ministry can be lonely and isolating. He knew that if he offered himself for the gospel, it would take sacrifices. But he also knew that Jesus was at work in the midst of that, creating community marked by flourishing and wholeness and strength in adversity. And so, as I read this, the thing that just kind of comes back for me again and again and again, I just can't get away from it, is that the gospel-worthy life is a team effort and not a solo gig. It takes a group of people caring for one another in deep, serious ways on a team, in a community, pick your favorite metaphor, whatever it is, like that's, it's togetherness, it's fellowship. It's never Lone Ranger Christianity. I'm out here flying solo or playing solo or whatever. Team effort, not a solo gig. Now for Paul, this comes out in some of the language that he uses. You hear him talk about his gratefulness for the sharing that he has with the Philippians. Let me read a little bit of this to you again. Verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you constantly praying with joy 
in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. He mentions the first day, and if, you want to, if you're interested in the first day, you can read about it in Acts 16. Paul's first trip to Philippi is recorded in Acts 16. Catch it when you get home this afternoon. And he shows up, and he goes down by the river outside the city gates, and there are some people there worshiping the God of Israel. One of them is named Lydia. She's probably the most well-known of the early converts in Philippi to Christianity. And we're told in Acts that God opened her heart. God was at work in her life to make some receptivity to the gospel, and the church in Philippi was born. So when Paul says, like, I'm excited about your sharing in the gospel from day one, that's what he's talking about. That's the vision, this lovely shared trust in Jesus. I want to linger on the word sharing for a minute. Now, we don't every Sunday do the Greek word is, that whole thing, unless it's really, really important. Today, we're going to do it a little bit, so hang in there. The good news is the Greek word is probably one you've heard of if you've hung out in churches very often, and if not, just hang out for a while and you'll hear it, like in the next 30 seconds. It's coming. This is one like if you go to a church, there's often a Sunday school class named with this Greek word. There's like two or three Greek words. You can, if, if you're going to get a Sunday school class with a Greek name, it's one of these couple of words, right? The word here is koinonia, and it shows up a couple of times in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Later on, Paul talks about all of you share in God's grace with me in verse, uh, that's verse 7. So what's so important about this word? So the word was used in the ancient world for any sort of partnership, right? So like, let's say a couple of business owners want to come up with a contract that is going to govern their partnership. That's a koinonia, right? Paul is a leather worker, so maybe you live in the first century, and you're kind of in the bit, and you're a supplier, and he's got, he needs some supplies, and so you and him form this koinonia. It's kind of a business partnership contract. But that's not all it is. And it's used with great, like much deeper significance in Philippians. Like it's a shared commitment, but when we read Philippians 1, we get that it's a shared commitment with a lot more depth to it than, hey, I'll provide this, you pay that. What is it? In Philippians and in the early church, koinonia was this deep, abiding, shared commitment of passion for the gospel. Like this wasn't just like, hey, let's get together and go to church on Sundays. This was, let's knit our lives together and commit to one another, like covenant together and share this ministry for the sake of the glory of God and the good of the world. Now, that's important for us because it's really, really, really easy, especially in North American Christianity, to sort of assume that ministry is what the pastors do or the staff. And maybe there's a few people in the, like in the congregation who have leadership and they're kind of helping out with some stuff. But by and large, it's their job. I will say, I don't get the vibe that that's really, we've been together for about a month now. That doesn't seem to be a driving thing here. Like there's a lot more shared commitment to the ministry than in a lot of churches. And I'm grateful for that. That's one of the reasons I wanted to come and partner with you. <laughs> but it happens a lot. Where like in American Christianity, it's almost like church is a spectator sport or something. Some leaders do the stuff and everybody else watches. You kind of get some benefits, I think. And everybody's happy at the end of the day. And some stuff gets done. Paul pushes back against that, though, doesn't he? Like, look at the introduction to the letter itself. Who's the letter addressed to? The lead pastor? No. The staff? No. The board? No. A committee? No. The letter is addressed to all the saints. Saints is just a word for the church, the believers. It's actually the term 
that is most commonly used for Christians in the New Testament? Saints, holy ones, people whose lives are being transformed by Jesus to embody his character, right? Most common name for the church. To all the saints, not just some of you, not just this group or that group, like everybody in Philippi who belongs to Jesus, this is for you. With the leadership, but not just the leadership. All of you, together, share with me, Paul says, in this koinonia, covenantal commitment to the mission of God in the world. It's a big deal for Paul. Crazy big deal. Like He's not casual about this, is he? It's not like, eh, take it or leave it, koinonia. It's I thank God every time I pray for the fellowship we have. Even though we're, we're separated right now, there's this thoroughgoing fellowship that we have, and it goes way back from when I first met you. And we're committed to the same thing, not just the pastors, all of you. I want to make sure you're tracking with me. Raise your hand if you're all of you. Some of you don't, like, okay. Let's try one more time. If you fit in the category of all of you, now we're getting somewhere, right? Right. So this, you see the point. Like this isn't just, Koinonia is not a spectator sport for Paul. Everyone is involved and committed, and he's grateful for it. He's grateful for it. So there's this community that is being cultivated and developed and knit together for the glory of God and for the good of the church. And for the life of the world. This is how the mission happens. Jesus brings people together. So that's one word, this koinonia word. It's deep, it's serious, it's expansive, it's big. And Paul kind of takes it and just fills it up with this rich meaning. There's another set of words that give us an idea about how important the community is. This is like we're talking about the team, not somebody flying solo. And it comes in the pronouns that Paul uses, specifically one, the pronoun you. Now, if you're an English teacher, this is for you. If you're not, you can listen in. But the grammar nerds, Bradley, it's coming. In English, we use the word you to talk about you as an individual, hey, you, Jody, come here. Don't really. It's just illustration. And we mean one person. We also use that same word, confusingly, to talk about you. Be sure to fill out your card or whatever it is, right? We want you to come to this, and we want you to come, and we're talking about all of us, aren't we? It's a second person now. You, and it can mean individual or plurality. Now, in the South, we have a solution for the confusion, don't we? Greek shares the solution, just so you know. <laughs> we have you, and we have... I, don't, I can stop. Team effort, not a solo. Good. We have you and we have y'all. We also have an emphatic plural second person pronoun. This is getting really technical now. I told you it was going to be bad. You know what it is? Right here, George. Come on, say it louder. Oh, y'all, that's right. So in Greek, you have a singular you. They have a different word because they know better than to use the same word for different things (laughs) sometimes. All, like y'all. And then he can take that word all and stick it in front of the plural and get the ancient equivalent of all y'all. Did you know that? So guess which one doesn't show up one time in Philippians 1, 1 through 11? The singular. Because he's not singling out individuals. He's talking about a community. So I'm going to retranslate it, all right? You ready for this? We're going to retranslate it, and I can't decide what to call it. I'm leaning towards the living southern version. It hasn't been published yet, but maybe we can work that out. Just hang with me, and I hope the point will be made. Eleven verses. 
Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace to y'all. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember y'all constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for not y'all, but all y'all. See that all of you there? This is an all y'all. Emphatic second person plural pronoun. I told you, English teachers, this is your sermon. I've lost my place. Verse 5, because of, uh, yeah, my prayers for all y'all. Because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now, I'm confident of this, that the one who began a good work among y'all will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It's right for me to think this way about all y'all, because y'all hold me in y'all's hearts. For all y'all share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all y'all with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that y'all's love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help y'all to determine what is best, so so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Does the community matter for Paul? Is the community the priority? Is he talking to a bunch of solo Christians doing their Lone Ranger devotions? Not even close. We can be silly and we can kind of have some fun. That's fine. But the reality is, Jesus died to save a church. His church. A community. And if he's willing to bleed to bring us together, Shouldn't we be willing to invest our best in what he's done in this community? We get the pressures. There's isolation. There's withdrawing. I don't have time. My kids have practice Wednesday night. I can't make it this time. Like, and stuff comes up sometimes. Like, don't, don't hear me say, like, if you're not here every time the doors are open, you're a bad Christian. That's not what we're getting at question is, are we invested in the community Jesus died for? Are we figuring out ways to say, I'm there. Like Jesus, if it matters that much to you, I'm going to show up and I'm going to be present and I'm going to offer myself and I'm going to offer myself not just generally, but particularly to certain people, whether it's a Sunday school class or a small group or the team of people I serve with on Sunday mornings, whatever it is. And we'll find, as we give ourselves to that, the team effort, Jesus will use it to reproduce his life in us, to make us able to live a life worthy of his gospel. That's the fruit. That's where this thing is going. That's where Paul is carrying this. Like, if you are, because you are recipients and participants, sharers, of God's grace with me, like the thing that he's doing, like I'm confident he's going to bring it to completion. It's going to bear fruit. You're going to grow in righteousness. You're going to overflow more and more with knowledge and love and insight. Like this is a vision of a church that's flourishing, isn't it? Isn't that what he offers us? Here's what it looks like when people come together and offer themselves for each other. They flourish. You know, it's interesting to spend some time thinking about all the different, let's call them identities that we all have. In this room, who knows how many neighborhoods are represented or areas of the city or suburbs. In this room, who knows how many professional backgrounds are present. This job, that vocation. Different socioeconomic statuses, different ethnicities. What's the one thing we all share in common in this room right now? 
It's not our neighborhood. It's not our job. This isn't a corporate meeting. The one thing we all share in common isn't a thing. He's a person. And his name is Jesus. And we share a calling that he has given us. Not to fly solo. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. But to dig in to the local church. Because that's what he's doing. That's it. That, that's what he's building. Little bodies of believers all over the world who share little in common sometimes other than the fact that Jesus has taken hold of them. And there's no other organization in the world, I think, that, can, that has done that really successfully. That's why we have so much conflict. Whether it's around race, politics, other divisive topics. Like we draw the lines and we, we know who's not one of us, don't we? And if you're not aware, like turn on the news and they'll tell you who's not one of you. Again and again and again. But when we come in this room, we have one identity that supersedes everything else, don't we? And it defines us and it drives us. And it's ours because Jesus has incorporated us into his body. Not a solo gig, a team operation, a shared mission, koinonia, fellowship. All of you share with me. And so we, <laughs> we need to be attentive to the tendencies we have to withdraw, don't we? I mean, what's the practical side of this? Like, am I aware of the concrete, measurable, specific ways that I've offered myself to the community of believers? And am I aware of the tendencies I may have to step back. I've been preaching long enough where if I had a nickel for every time somebody told me they should worship God, they could worship God in a deer stand or on the golf course as well as they could in the church, I'd have a lot of nickels. And yeah, you can worship God anywhere, absolutely, by all means. But don't mistake what happens here for private devotional somewhere else. And don't ever think that daily prayers replace the gathered worship of the saints. It's not an either or, it's a both and. For Jesus, in Scripture, in Philippians, this is the most important thing in the world. The fruit that comes out of the gathered church is the most important thing in the world. How important is it? Important enough for the Son of God to bleed for it. We shouldn't take that lightly, should we? We shouldn't take that lightly. And so I'm asking, like, how do I get deeper into the life of this community? How do I get deeper into the life of Koinonia? And I'm excited, again, like, as we're getting to know each other these first few weeks. Like, there's some incredibly healthy space and process for you to show up at Christ Church and get plugged in. Straight up. And interestingly, I'll share this with you. This is one of the things I learned about Christ Church long before I ever got here. So months ago, I was interviewing with Staff Parish Relations Committee and meeting the search committee. I called a couple of my friends, colleagues, other pastors, some are in other states. One guy was in northwest Florida. I was just kind of saying, you know, let's talk about this church. Like, is this a wise move? Like, tell me about, like, what do you know? What are we doing? What do I do? And one of the things my colleague said to me, he said, Matt, there's a guy in my church who was up there recently. I don't remember if the guy had moved to Florida or his, one of his children somebody knows goes to church here, but he said, 
their process for getting people plugged in to discipleship is as good as any church I've ever seen. It's like, that's a healthy process. And people are moving down that pathway. So it's not a spectator sport. We've always got to be vigilant to guard against that tendency. But thanks be to God, there have been years of faithful ministry that have happened in this place. So the people show up and they get integrated into the koinonia. He specifically mentioned the foundations class on the phone with me, a guy in Florida. And so maybe you're like, maybe you're new to the church and you're like, how do I get plugged into that? August 20th, starting point, right? 9.30 a.m., show up, we'll gather, and we'll get oriented to what the next steps on the path are. Why? Because we trust that this only works well if we're doing it together. Because the vision of Christianity that emerges from texts like Philippians 1 show us that if we want to flourish, we flourish together. And if we try to run it solo, don't expect to flourish. Don't expect to be fruitful if you're trying to follow Jesus by yourself. Maybe a little bit here and there. But the real fruitfulness shows up when we are integrated into the community of saints. In many ways, this is part of what it means to be Methodist. We talk about John Wesley some. 18th century Church of England life was rather a bit stale, believe it or not. <laughs> call it cultural Christianity, call it not much Christianity. There wasn't much going on exciting in the 1700s in churches in England. And then the Holy Spirit got, got hold of a very short priest. And he started preaching gospel. And he got run out of a lot of churches because a lot of folks just wanted to be dry. Why? Well, this community thing's tough, isn't it? It takes a lot. And so he saw the church, and he didn't set out to start a new denomination called Methodism. He set out to renew the church that was right in front of him. And you know how he did it? He built little communities all over the place. Different sizes, different levels of depth, and different levels of self-giving, but little communities all over the place. The biggest kind of group was like maybe a midweek prayer meeting kind of thing if we were going to do it today, but he called them societies. It's very 18th century England if you're into that sort of thing, societies. Men and women, you didn't have to be a Christian to come, just show up, there's going to be preaching, there's going to be singing, there's going to be praying, we're going to have church. The only requirement for showing up at the society, get this, was a desire to flee the wrath to come. <laughs> Anybody in on that? <laughs> that was it, right? I'm good. Like, bring it on. Let's do it. Societies. Then he had a next step. Wesley was a big fan of next steps. He's like, if you want to get closer to Jesus, we have another group for you. We call them class meetings. This was more like a Sunday school or like a Wednesday night Bible study. Maybe a dozen, maybe 20 people show up, men and women. And they're just, they're learning together. They're getting deeper. They're going to pray together. They're going to get to know each other a little more. Like you can't get to know 200 people intimately. But 12, like you can, you can build some connectedness there, right? And then if you're really serious about Jesus, he had another meeting for you, another little community, another koinonia. He called them bands. They didn't involve instruments. Four or five folks, men with men, women with women. And they got in each other's business for the glory of God and the good of their neighbor. Let's talk about the challenges we are facing. Not so we can knock each other around or chew up with a Bible, so we can walk with you and care for you and love you. So that we can all grow in grace and grow in Christ-likeness and grow in wholeness and flourish. Why? Why plug in? Deeply, don't you want to flourish? Don't you want to flourish? And the movement all the way through, Methodists have been at our best 
when we are putting people in groups. Again and again and again. Last crucial piece here that kind of jumps out of this text, thinking about what it looks like to be a part of the team versus individual solo Lone Ranger style discipleship, which isn't actually discipleship. It's unavoidable that Paul is facing some serious adversity here, isn't he? Dude's in chains. He's a captive. He's not free to go. That's adversity. Can't get where he wants to be. He wants to be with his community. But he can't get there. But it's the knowledge that they are caring for him. We'll find out later they're sending him support. There's one guy who came to care for Paul, almost died on the way. Talk about self-giving love. And it was the knowledge for Paul that even though I can't be near you, even though I'm isolated, you hold me in your heart enough to risk your life to care for me in my isolation. This gospel-oriented community, if you've ever been in a crisis, who did you turn to? These are the people who care for you. These are the people who love you more than themselves. People in whom the Holy Spirit is bearing fruit. Life will be tough. You don't have to be in this world very long to learn that you will face pain. The question is, when you do, is there a community of life-giving love to care for you and carry you? And to give you the opportunity to carry someone else when they need it. That's the vision of church that emerges out of these opening verses of Philippians. It's about the team. Not about isolated Christians. And so the question for us then becomes, where do I need to plug in? What does that look like for me, for my family? Do I need to get connected to that starting point, new person orientation thing? Do I need to connect? Like, when's the next seven-week foundations? Maybe I've done all that, and I'm kind of like, you know, I'm not sure I really want to lay it on the line for these folks. Like, (laughs) Jesus is saying, come. The local church is where the action is for me. Lots of good things happen in lots of places. You are the people through whom the Lord Jesus Christ desires to bring the good news of his salvation to the world. Take a look around at each other. I know it's surprising. This is his plan for all of us. It doesn't work if we step back. It'll work. We just won't participate in it. So take an inventory. And consider where the Spirit of God is saying, here's somebody that needs you to touch their life. Here's some students that need a mentor, a discipler. Here's a Sunday school class that needs a facilitator. We need those, by the way. Here's some trash that needs to be taken out. Here's a song that needs to be sung. Here's a study to attend. Here's a mission trip to go on. You want to experience community, go on a short-term trip. You will be drawn into an experience of community you've not had before. Whatever it is, wherever it is, wherever the Lord is inviting you to take the next step in relation to his church, do not resist. 
Don't resist. Resist the temptation to fly solo. Give yourself to the community that Jesus purchased with his blood.